Let's get started. Welcome. Uh, so good that you are here. Is there anybody here who does not understand Dutch? One person. All right, that's going to be, then I'll stick to English. If you cannot hear me, just come closer to me. Um, I'm going to, the, the, the title of my talk is uh, Introducing the Open Source Hardware Association in the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, open hardware. However, just to, to get that out of the way, the Open Source Hardware Association Netherlands is no more, or at least for the time being. What we've been trying to do, Open Source Hardware Association is an association from the US uh, promoting uh, the use of open hardware or open source hardware and we had the idea at earlier this year to start a Dutch uh, branch, a Dutch version with that. Uh, we have been doing some meetups, seeing if we can get something going. However, we have noticed for three reasons that maybe right now is not a good time. That's why I also put there for now. The first is that it seems to be that there are only a few people in the Netherlands who already understand open source hardware and are working on it. Uh, so that makes it pretty difficult to get something going in the Netherlands, we noticed. Uh, the second reason is that we also didn't get a lot of um, support from the US. It was like they were not waiting for us to start something in the Netherlands. We've waited for months to even get some reply from them, but that's fine. But the third and for me the most important reason is that for uh, Oshwa, is how people pronounce it most of the time, you're not allowed to do things commercially. And for me, working with open hardware, I'm a big open hardware enthusiast. Doing something commercially is like one of the most interesting parts. Because maybe making the hardware and designing it and engineering it is interesting. But how can you make a business model out of it is maybe the, the biggest challenge. As is also for, for free and open source software. So these three combined made, made me decide, okay, maybe let's put Oshawa now aside for now. But continue with open hardware. And we are doing that right, that, that right now with our own organization. I will tell you more about it. Um, so don't worry. This hour is still going to be filled with open, uh, open source hardware. So uh, maybe to start with the obvious. Um, what, what is open hardware? Um, so since we have a really small uh, audience, which is actually nice, so it can be more interactive. Um, can you raise your hand if you know what open hardware is? Oh, everybody already knows it. Okay, that's great. So can you tell me something about open hardware, something that, you, that comes to mind for you? Uh, yeah, like, uh, um, like publishing source code for hardware, the, the designs of the PCBs, etc. they're published. The right. Have, to have open documentation. Right, exactly. And, and when they have open documentation, they are published. You can do something with it, right? You can change it, etc. So, when I think of hardware, it's like a physical object. The first that can come to mind, if you're not in electronics like us, but every all hardware is is open, right? I mean, if I buy a chair like this, I can look at it. I can change the chair to how I want. But the trick is, if you are, you're not, yeah, if you have the tools. Sorry? I, don't agree, I don't agree that you can just copy it because it's been made by, uh, in a specific way and the way it's made can be very hard to understand or you, it's very hard to find how it's made just yeah, by Okay, so, so even, even with a chair it's already difficult yeah. but again, my, my point is that why are we looking at open hardware now or why not 50 years ago? And I think one reason can be that more and more electronics and sophisticated technology is put into our products and the tendency for people who make these products is to close them up. Legally, you're not allowed to do something. Technically, they glue it shut or use some kind of <coughs> screws that make it impossible for you to open it up or technically. It's like, okay, there is a firmware on it but I have no idea how to, to change it or how to reprogram it. Um, so I like to explain it with this, for you, you already know it, but just quickly, the iPad 1, I have one at home. It looks like new, brand new, no scratch on it, but it has become pretty much unusable because there only runs an old version of iOS on it. You cannot install a new version of iOS. That's why you cannot install any new apps. I cannot run 
Linux on it or something else. I, I think it's maybe possible with a lot of tinkering, but it's not easy. Cannot change the battery because they put it so far away in the, in the gadget that you cannot do that. So that's like the opposite. Uh, also another story I like to tell about um, the possible impact of open hardware is that I start out with, okay, you have these two guys, you of course know who they are, so, and then I say, well, what they have done, they've made something, they've been at the start of creating a system that's now in 80% of all the smartphones, that is uh, under 90% of all the biggest websites, all the Google servers, the millions of servers have it at their core, and I would say that they have made a bigger impact on ICT uh, and software than Bill Gates and Steve Jobs combined. And then of course this is the Linux operating system and with that like the open free uh, innovation model that they have brought to the software industry. And then the question is can this open model of innovation cross from bits and bytes to atoms? And that's like the, the predicament of, of open hardware, which right now is in an experiment. People are testing with it. It's not, it's not by far not as far as uh, free and open source software is. Um, yeah, of course, then you have the, the Oshwa.org has a definition, which when you read it, of course, is very familiar. Um, from the definition of free and open source software, like free to 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 make it, to change it, etc. Uh, and then they have something about why maximize the ability of individuals to make their own. Well, we already know that, right? Who knows this one? Please la raise your hand. One, only one, two. This is a revolver. It's sort of like the GitHub for, uh, for open hardware. Um, yeah, so that's one of the things that's popping up, you know. Uh, for open source software, we have our developed methods, we have our platforms like GitHub and other platforms that we use to make this stuff. But for hardware, we don't know yet. Revolver is one, is by a Dutch guy called Bram Gene working on it. And, uh, well, he has a very nice platform. But if you look at, okay, how can we work together on making these open hardware uh, products, it's not as smooth yet as with, uh, with software. Uh, yeah, so when you go into it, you see like a, a graph structure of the different components and you have like a wiki kind of explanation on the left, etc. It's nice, it's, but it should be improved. Please raise your hand if you know the Things Network. No, it's a, uh, it's uh, has, has anybody heard about LoRa or LoRa One? Yeah, one person, two, three. Okay, so there is like this thing going on called Internet of Things. It's a big hype word, but it does come down to that more and more products are connected. And one thing you want if they are connected is to have a, a simple way of feeding data to the device or getting data from the device. And it's very expensive to put Wi-Fi chips or uh, 4G uh, SIM cards in all these products. So what they've done is they made different kinds of machine-to-machine -machine networks and one of them is LoRa. By the LoRa Alliance, it's an open standard. And what uh, Wienke Giesemann has done, he's a, a Dutch guy, he said, okay, what if we make these um, these networks are free and open. My st he started a movement called the Things Network. Right now uh, Amsterdam uh, has been covered and more and more cities are also hopping on to create an, an open and free network for anybody to use for their Internet of Things products. And the hardware that they are developing um, is also uh, open hardware and uh, they just did a Kickstarter campaign for it. It was very successful. They have, I think, more than 100,000 euros to start making these products for everybody. There's something going on? Ah, the noise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's no noise anymore, but also no screen. Oh. <laughs> 
So what do you want? Screen or a noise or? <laughs> okay. I think those microphones. The microphone, yeah. Turn off the microphones. Hello. Yeah. Now the noise is gone. The noise is gone, and the microphones the not. And the screen is on. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> Don't move, <laughs> Mr. Bean. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so f as going for an open hardware example, open hardware project, even a Dutch project, I think this is a great example of how, things, how quickly things can go. Yes? Yeah, I found uh, yeah, a little uh, uh, remark on open hardware. Of course, on the Internet of Things, eh? yes. what talking about. Yes. Because open hardware is all about uh, that, the, that the user has like power to, to, uh, to continue his product. Yes. It's like continu that the continuity of the product is like a like a like a safe like good. So you can make like a, a production line or something. Yeah. Like the things is the opposite. Yes. And the things is is brought to us like a hype, like oh you have to do this and product like that nice and big. But it's like a it's like a big brawl up in the sky. It's like a, every uh, product uh, it can be a sensor for somebody that can uh, monitor everything. Yes. Everybody is do doing. Yes. So I think before you start making Internet of Things. I think it's better to first talk about how we can make it like a safe, how we can make it like yes. that it can be safely implemented without uh, yeah, jeopardizing our privacy. Exactly. Further. Yes. So yes. Yeah, there's a, for me, it's a little bit of contradiction. I like open hardware. Yeah. But it, it things for me is a little bit like a no go. Yes. Personally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I'm going to tell you about a project that we are working on mm -hmm. uh, to combine them to combine open hardware with Internet of Things to solve some of the problems that you mentioned. Okay. So I, inv I invite you, if I'm not clear at that point, and you still have questions, please, please ask them. Yeah? So this is, I think I, I just uh, supported this project. It's, a, it's an open hardware uh, router. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I think it's cool because there's, there's a lot of open hardware out there, but a lot of them is not aimed at getting a big impact, like a consumer kind of product, and this one is. And I already had like the Think Penguin uh, router, which is completely blob uh, free, but the hardware itself is not uh, not open yet, and this one uh, this one is. So I hope it comes through because you never know with uh, this crowdfunding uh, stuff. But uh, this is another example that I supported but failed miser miserably. Of course, you know uh, the Chromecast by Google. This is sort of the same thing, but then uh, a dongle that is completely open uh, open hardware as well, and uh, they just didn't uh, didn't follow through, unfortunately. Another point I would like to make is, of course, that you, as you have with software, you also get with hardware something I like to call open washing. So it's like they say it's open source, but it's actually not. So you, all of course, know Oculus Rift. But do you know this one? Who knows OSVR? Nobody? It's like, sort of looks like the open source version of the Oculus Rift. But I've read the, the license agreement. But it's actually not that open because everything you do, all the, um, the intellectual property you create, so to say, goes back to the people of OSVR. So they are in complete control of the platform and can at any point decide anything that they want to do, sort of bait and switch, anything. So I think also with software, but also with hardware, we need to pay attention to is it really uh, licensed openly or is it just masquerading? Um, yeah, so this guy also made some interesting remarks about uh, what he calls uh, free digital hardware designs. If you haven't read the articles on Wired by Richard Stallman, I recommend, and you're interested in open hardware, I re recommend you to read them. Uh, what he says is, uh, one thing he's going about is non-free hardware an injustice, because of course to Richard Stallman, uh, non-free software is an injustice. So ethically speaking, it's not, not right. And w when he's talking about hardware, he says, well, for functional objects, which don't, do not have any digital hardware, he says the same ethical uh, reasoning can be done. And he says for digital hardware, uh, not yet, because you cannot uh, copy and distribute hardware in the same way as software yet. Because it still has to be made in factories, whereas software, I can just run it on my own computer. And once we can run hardware on our own computer, or meaning we have 3D printers that can make digital hardware, then he argues the same goes 
for, for hardware. Or FPGA designs. Sorry? FPGA designs. Yes. That's also, then you can make your own hardware, so to say. Uh, yes. On top of an FPGA chip. Yes. Your own design, digital design. And you can just copy it. Yes. You can, co it's sort of like software then, right? Yes. Yeah, right. Um, so, then I would take, like to present to you what we have been doing. We started an organization last year called Totem, and our goal was to start curating open hardware products. And also products that are not just very exclusive type of things for only a few people in the world, but really like consumer type of stuff that everybody uh, or a lot of people could use. And we have, right now we have three projects, and uh, one of them is uh, the Totem Energy Monitor and it connects to the smart meter and I know you all think that the smart meter is a bad thing and I agree actually but on the other hand I think it's pretty cool that you can have real-time really detailed access to your own energy data directly from your own house so it sort of for me was like a trade-off, okay, on the one hand I don't agree with that they are installing these things but on the other hand it's pretty cool to have that data However, the smart meter in the Netherlands is not so smart that you can actually get the data to your phone or your, or your computer. You need something in between to translate the data that's in the meter to TCP IP. And uh, yeah, we're working on that right now. And we have a, uh, a working prototype. We had some problems with an earlier version that we created our own version of the hardware. But we now are, are in the Arduino prototype phase, just Arduino Uno with an Ethernet shield and then we soldered our own thing on top to connect it to uh, the smart meter and uh, we have it running for different versions of the smart meter because there is fortunately a standard in the Netherlands that says what the data should look like that's coming from the meter however this had different versions with different baud rates from coming from the data port and these kind of things. And we've connected this thing to something called Emon CMS, which is like open source uh, software to store your energy data and to present these nice uh, graphs out of it. So it's pretty cool that also there are already people making uh, software for energy data and you can just use it. Another project we're working on is, uh, is this one, is Code Captains. It's, um, this is like version four, version four of our prototype. It's a, it's a robot and uh, you can use it to learn programming. Or not you of course, but you go, because you already know how to do it. <laughs> but maybe your children or somebody else. And uh, what is nice about this thing, besides that it's completely open hardware, is that we put this groovy connector on top. It has Arduino inside and you can, you know, you can, uh, you can start simple. You can just take it out of the box and then it has some sensor proximity sensors and you can use Google Blockly or Scratch to do the visual programming and then if you if you want something more you can connect it to micro USB and you direct, can directly program the Arduino uh, processor in it and if that's not enough you can start to do plug on boards or you can 3D print your own casings etc. And the third one we are working on right now is the Totem Open Health and our idea was, well the, the thing is, and I will tell you a little bit more about it, that we, we like these um, new technology and innovation and the wearables, however we don't want to send all our data to some server in the, in the USA, right? Um, so we noticed that on the one hand we like it, but on the other hand we don't like how they get our data, so we didn't use these products. And then we thought, oh, we can just start something ourselves. We can create our own product and then do it the right way, so to say. So we're working on that right now. And uh, we have our first version produced, 100 of them. And we are giving them, well, not, we are loaning them to people who want to, uh, to test and experiment with them. And uh, we are we're getting some traction. I'll tell you more about it. And look at this one. So Gardner says that 
In 2016, there will be 90 million wearable devices uh, sold. And if you read the tech blocks, then pretty much every week or something, you can read about a new wearable device that's coming on the market. Almost finished. Maybe you know some of them. I have some, some here, actually. It's the, uh, the scanner do. It's sort of like a, like a tricorder from Skytrack. You put it to your head and then it starts to measure things about you. If you want to test it, you can uh, after my presentation. Uh, we found these ones from, uh, from China. They basically have the same hardware as the, the more famous Fitbit and Jawbone, but like super cheap. And also the more advanced stuff like this is from Vital Connect. It's actually like a, like a patch you can put on your chest and then it measures your heart rate and your position and your respiration and all these things. So, but what is the problem with all these devices? So one thing is that a third of all fitness trackers are abandoned after six months. So what does that mean? People buy them because they think they're cool, but that maybe they don't do exactly what they were thought they would be doing. The only way that somebody can change it is the producer, because you cannot change the firmware, you cannot change the apps or whatever. So people don't like it anymore, they put it away. That's a big problem, a waste. Also, activity monitors give inaccurate readings for many forms of exercise. So if you have one, you may start to notice that it doesn't, you compare it, for example, to a strap that you have that measures your heart rate, and then you have this new device, and it's not correct. However, you don't have the possibility to improve the algorithms, you don't even have the possibility to look at the algorithms, and you don't have the possibility to get the data that they're gathering about you. We also saw this as a, as a problem. And, I don't know if you've seen this one, that right now already people are uh, convicted in court because they have, uh, uh, have been using a Fitbit. So people, somebody gave a testimony like, at this time I didn't do anything because I was sleeping. And then they saw, okay, but you have a Fitbit and they started looking at the Fitbit data of this person and I was like, hey, but your Fitbit says you were not sleeping. So what is the problem? Proprietary closed systems, right? I think we all agree on it. That, and I would like to say that a huge amount of social value is missed. Even though we have these millions of devices coming on the market, a huge amount of value is missed because people cannot change the technology to do something that they would want to do it. And then of course the solution is make it open so people can change it and do what they want with it. This is what we have uh, made right now. It's the first version of our, uh, of our sensor. It has a three axis accelerometer and gyroscope, a temperature sensor. It can put raw data on a micro SD card. Uh, it has Bluetooth LE on it. The battery can last up to 40 days. And that depends on the sampling rate. So of course, if you, you, can, you can switch on sensors and off if you like how you want, and then you can set the sampling rate. If you use all the sensors at a thousand hertz, and of course your battery is empty very quickly. If you use a low frequency, then it lasts very long. I have it right here. It's this one. It's already a second version of the of the encasing that uh, that we have. The version that's here is the first version, but uh, the the battery compartment was not that that good. So we now have uh, have this version. Uh, after the talk, I'm happy to to show it to you and explain exactly what's inside. Yeah, so this is the new version. Uh, and then what you can do, of course, you can start gathering uh, uh, data. So what I did, I just took it to the gym for an hour, and you can already see the, the, the pattern for walking and rowing and running and, and cross uh, training are, are different. And you can do some analysis with that and then see, okay, I was, uh, I was cycling. You can see how many rotations I made and how fast and etc. So you're completely free to, to take your data and do what you want. And uh, as far as licenses are concerned, uh, we found 
that there is a, an open hardware license by uh, Saturn and that's a pretty nice license because it forces you and everybody who distributes the physical product to also include a link to the source files. So for example if you're using another type of license um, that could require only that you uh, uh, how do I explain it? When you use Creative Commons for example with hardware you're required to relicense the design files under Creative Commons. It doesn't say anything about the, the end physical product that you create. And with the Saturn Open Hardware license, it does say something about that. Uh, the source code of the firmware is under uh, GNU GPL version 3. You feel familiar with that. And uh, the documentation and everything is on uh, Creative Commons by attribution share alike uh, license. So we're also experimenting with that. Perhaps you think, oh, maybe this is not a good idea or that would be better. Please, uh, please tell us. We're also uh, just figuring stuff out on the way. Uh, who, who is familiar with uh, embedded software development here? Please raise your hand. There are a few people. Okay. Well, then for you, this type of stuff, I don't know. This, uh, does anybody use embed from Nordic? No? Okay, it's you use C to program it, and then we have uh, we've also created this programming jig. So what you can do, you can take out the the, the PCB out of the the sensor, which is like super small, and then you can put it in here. And you connect it to uh, to something that looks like this J Link, and then you connect this to your USB port, and then you can flash uh, the firmware. Uh, yeah, we also have a, a GitHub uh, uh, organization actually with a number of repositories, the products we're working on. As you can see, not that many people yet, only five people. Is, I have to say, it's, it's just a thing we are, we, are, we are building and we are just are starting to get going. Uh, Wiki as well to explain everything about the electronics that's inside and how we did things and why. Uh, we have been in the, in the final of the UNICEF Variables for Good uh, challenge. It was actually pretty cool because finally somebody else acknowledged that we may be doing something that's valuable. Uh, so out of 250 applications out of 40 countries, we were selected as the, as the last uh, 10. We didn't win unfortunately, but to be a finalist was already pretty nice. And what we did is made a, made a, we came up with um, something to monitor uh, a fetus uh, and a pregnant woman because we found uh, literature, scientific literature, that it's possible to use simple uh, accelerometer data to measure the movement of a, of a fetus and combining that, that you can do that very cheaply in places where you don't have this very expensive equipment uh, available uh, we thought it would be nice to, to be able to do that we also found that you can use our center, sensor to uh, help uh, people with P uh, PTSD to help them connect with their uh, emotions uh, and to detect uh, pneumonia. Uh, right now we are working with uh, an organization in the Netherlands called Sophia Revalidatie Centrum uh, and the Haagse Hogeschool, the Hague University of Applied Sciences to make an application for Parkinson's disease patients. And that is uh, something called freezing. Um, with, uh, does anybody know somebody with Parkinson's disease? Or maybe more? Okay, I'm, yeah? Okay, if, if I'm saying something that's wrong, please interrupt and correct me, okay? So these patients uh, typically uh, run into something called freezing, which is like when they have to stop, for example, for a revolving door, you have to stop to wait and then it's very difficult to start moving again and to break out of that they need an external cue for example somebody who calls them or somebody who gives them a push or something and what you can do with the, with the sensor is to detect that this freezing moment is happening and what you then can do is to g let the smartphone give a signal like audible or vibration to give that cue 
And what you can also do is start to measure movement and not like the Fitbit kind of movement like you did 5000 steps today but actually measure the length of the steps to say something how the disease of the person is uh, progressing or what is happening for the doctor. And the uh, Sophia Revalidatie Centrum already did a pilot project only with the data from a smartphone and was successful and now we are seeing with multiple parties okay can we make this into an actual uh, product. Uh, we also won the, the Proof It Award two weeks ago, which is from a medical uh, investment fund, which, which is nice that we get acknowledges from medical people uh, as well in that way. And we won 5,000 euros and we're now going to invest that in making uh, an Android app for, uh, for the sensor. So if you, if you like to play with, uh, with our uh, Totem Health sensor, you can go to our website and then uh, or just talk to me and then you can apply for, for a dev kit and we'll send you one and uh, you loan it from us and then uh, if you're done with it or we want it back you just send it back. Uh, yeah that was what I wanted to tell about um, uh, open hardware and the things we are working on and then I have some more things that uh, in my story that are things I notice and I wonder about and it's not, this part of the talk was more like I'm telling you what we are doing, etc. I um, don't pretend to know more than you, just uh, in comparison to other audience, I have to have a clear cut story or they don't understand it, but you are all experts and very smart, so I don't need to do that. But for this first part, are there any questions about it? <coughs> Did I answer your question about Internet of Things and open hardware? Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, so then th some things that are somehow related to open hardware, uh, but also related to TDOS. There's, for example, um, I made this graph based on data I found here and there. I can tell you after the talk exactly where I found it. So what you see here is the number of PCs, smartphones, tablets and connected things in use over the years. The graph is not complete because I couldn't find all the data, but what is noticeable is that you can see that the number of PCs in use is slowly uh, um, increasing over the years. And then you see smartphones coming up, it's growing pretty steep, it already crossed the number of PCs in use. You see tablets that is also going up, but another thing that is coming up is connected things. And when I was looking at the, the tracks for the T, for TDOS, I saw pretty much everything going about PCs. And I think I found four, four of the 40 or something that were not about PCs. And my, my question is, I'm not sure if it's true, but my question is, are we missing something here? I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about PCs because <coughs> what's a PC? Yeah, so in the definition of, of the numbers that I found, it's the X, x86 yeah, okay. architecture of PCs. Yeah, okay, but if you're talking about Arduino Uni, yeah. which is uh, a PC, but it's also embedded. No, but that's not in the numbers. So the, the blue line is not Arduino. Yeah, yeah but I mean, no, but what I mean is more and more embedded contains uh, x68, uh, uh, x86. Um, it's more and more X, the real Linux systems on embedded. Well, for, for, but I know for a lot of them it's not. Yeah, yeah, but I know there is more and more. So does that solve the challenge? No, what I mean is that uh, I'm not. I'm just stating yeah. that there are more and more embedded systems which contain a PC or. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Similar. Yeah, sure. So, uh, um, so, for instance, every uh, router or whatever yes. is actually a Linux machine. Yes, that's great. It's embedded, but yes. it's a Linux, so it's a yes. PC. It's exactly the same yes. thing as what I'm having here in my laptop. Right. Apart from it has less memory and stuff like that. But yes. More yeah, okay, so that could, that could be like an answer. So, the, the first, why I bring this up is because I think that all computers should run free and open source software. That's sort of like the premise. And my, uh, I, that's sort of what Richard Stallman says, and I think that maybe somehow you also like to think along the same way. 
you you don't agree okay then then for for you my point is is irrelevant but i sort of like to think okay if we have computers maybe it's nice that it runs software that we can change and that we can redistribute and those kind of things and then when we look at computers in our environment we see that it's not only pcs anymore but it's also our phones and also all other things like the the thermostat you have on your wall uh, your washing machine is getting it, your car, etc. And my question is, are we putting, giving enough attention to those developments that they also should, should run free and open source software? And if you say, well, it doesn't matter because in the end they will all run uh, x86 processors anyway, so they will all be able to run Linux, then it's fine. I'm not sure if that's true, but it could be. I don't have the answer. Yeah. yeah? No. I just have my doubts about um, it has to be open source. Yeah. I, mean, I like it to be open source. I try yeah. to use as much open source as I can. Yes. Um, I have been using, I actually started with using Windows a very long time ago. Yes. And I switched to Linux about three years ago. And I feel like switching back to Windows right now. Uh, I think that open source kind of like fails to deliver a very good GUI. Right, okay. Hold that thought. Uh, in 2014, I, uh, I went to Libre Planet, and there were two takeaway things, takeaway points I took from there. One is, the GUIs are not good enough. That was not what I said, but it's what I noticed in all the different sessions. Like, the software that Open source software is really, really good software. However, at some point, it's missing the good user interfaces. Maybe because the people who use it are typically very technical, so they don't find it very important or something. The other thing that I took away there is that we are missing uh, sustainable business models. How do you earn money with open source? And maybe those two come together somehow. So I think that still, that was 2014, it's already 2015, you know, it was like more than a year ago, and we still uh, have this, uh, this challenge, I think. And then uh, I was on vacation uh, last week, uh, it was very nice, and somebody uh, a few weeks ago recommended me this, uh, this book, it's by Jaron Lanier, also the author of You Are Not a Gadget, <coughs> who, who, who knows this guy or has read this book? Nobody, okay. Well, it was before last week, I was all about like open and free and we just make the whole society knowledge open, open content, open education, it's all great. And we just keep moving that way and then we will have a great society, something like that, right? I like to call myself a pragmatic idealist. I see this ideal view, but I just like to work on things right now. And then I read this book and I start to think, oh, maybe he has a point, what he says actually it's not a good idea to make everything free as in gratis uh, because when you cannot make money anymore out of it you create maybe one of the problems that we have right now with the GUI and the business models we should find a way to make money and maybe donations uh, is not enough maybe we should move to something else than just donation based working and people who spend their free time working on, on free and open source software uh, another thing, uh, I'm now, there's a book coming about Creative Commons and it was very, they did a kick, Kickstarter or crowdfunding for it and it was very easy to become a co-editor uh, of the book, so now I'm co-editor of the next uh, Creative Commons <laughs> book. Um, but the thing is that they just published uh, their first chapter on medium.com and uh, Amanda Palmer, I didn't know her before, but Coincidentally, they have put Amanda Palmer in this article and the book also talks about Amanda Palmer that Amanda Palmer is like the example how to do things in a new economy to gather a community, to do crowdfunding, etc. and for creative comments this is like oh everybody should start doing it whereas in the book they argue well this is like an anomaly she was able to do it because crowdfunding was new and she was one of the first one and that's why she was successful but don't think that everybody can repeat her pattern and also start to earn a living that's sort of one of the other problems that we have so everybody is then trying to copy this well that doesn't work 
Another thing I noticed, I hear applause next door, so I check my watch, do I still have five minutes? Uh, another thing I noticed in the newsletter of the FSFE is that one of the new things that, that somebody was refurbishing old laptops and putting uh, Linux on them and then selling them. Which of course, in, in, in essence, is fine, of course, sure. But when I'm thinking about if we're doing like of the battle with the proprietary closed things, then this seems to me so small. Um, and I think we need to, to figure out a way again to do something else, to earn money in a, in a different way. There's also an interesting thing that came by on Commons Transition. Um, how uh, maybe we can find a, find a way as co-ops. I, I love co-ops, I don't know why, but when I read about co-ops, I just love them and I just also want to, to be involved with one of them. And this article explains how maybe a co-op, I think then combined also with a free and open source software, can uh, successfully be an alternative to something like uh, Uber. Or Uber, do you say Uber or Uber? We also don't know, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so who, who thinks that Uber is like a super awesome good thing? Yeah, one person? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so on first phase it looks like it's a good thing, but when you d dig a little bit deeper, and Richard Stallman has some really nice articles on his website about it, it's not such a good idea, because Uber is getting a lot of power because of the position they create, and the people that work for them become this kind of, people become the machines actually. They end up in these dead-end jobs, earning only a little bit of money. And I think it's interesting to see, maybe we can, we can challenge that, you know? Let's do that, let's challenge Uber, why not? Another thing is what you, Jan, you came with that one. Uh, Patreon.com, who knows Patreon.com? Oh, okay, <laughs> most of you. So uh, that could be, uh, I think, a, no a nice alternative to how make money with uh, developing open source uh, software going away from, uh, or it's still donation based, but it's a different kind of, of donation based. And I think we, we need more of these things to, and I want to become successful. So people can make a living out of, more people can make a living out of making free and open source uh, software. I would love to see that. Yeah. Did you have problems with Uber having uh, too much power? Uh, Patreon uh, can actually destroy projects if they, if they want to. Who? What? If they uh, somehow disagree with you, uh, the way Who? you run your project or whatever, they they can they, they can sort of take all your donations and then run with it. But a Patreon. Yeah. Yeah, but that that would be then a, a, a challenge to create a better version of Patreon, right? <laughs> yeah. Well. Yes, I think that's what we need. We need more experiments, and if you have a better idea, please let's do it. Uh, better idea would have like a donation system that isn't political. All oh, right. And distributed. Have exactly federated, distributed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to moderate, and Patreon does moderate. Uh -huh. Okay. That's Maybe awesome. some a topic for a, for for a talk or discussion. It's very interesting. Yeah, I think so. So I'm closing off right now. Uh, Totem. It's not just me, of course, but it's a bunch of people. The community is growing. You can apply for a death kit of the Totem Health Center. We also have meetups in and around uh, The Hague and Rotterdam. And my name is Diederik van Wingede. And this is my email address and phone number. And come play with the gadgets if you want. I'll be at the FSFE booth. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention.